Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 476. We know that because it's right on the screen. Isn't that cool? I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Monday, January the 14th, 2019. Okay, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. Um, believe it or not, we have people in our audience who love the show, and we really appreciate that. So we're going to let you participate. We're going to let you share the show, so please mm. share this with your friends. Uh, comment on YouTube or comment on Facebook where you want to comment. A lot of people have been uh, helping us with that. Uh, if you would please like the page or like the show, that would help a lot. And if you want to listen to the podcast, the address for that is in the show notes. Biggest news last... Yes, George? And, and Kevin, like the Bishop of Oxford, as Gavin mentioned last week, we're listening to you. We are, we're here. We're listening. Seriously, uh, unlike the Bishop of Oxford, <laughs> we actually want to hear what you have to say about the issues that we raise, because we don't provide all the answers. We raise the questions, and we're interested to hear what you have to say about these things. No, it's, it's amazing, all the comments and all the time you guys take to put into the comments. We do read them all. Some are scathing and how wrong we are. We get that. Some are complimentary. We get that. Some are corrective, you know, with little jots and tittles. And we get that. And we enjoy those as well. Let's, the biggest news last week, we need to do a quick update. Uh, Bishop Love of Albany has responded to presiding Bishop Michael Curry. Can you give us a quick update, George? Bishop Love, on Saturday night, uh, the diocese released his statement. Bishop Love will contest his partial inhibition. And it's a, it's a positive step forward because Bishop Love will test the legal theories being put forward to uh, compel him to permit same-sex marriage in his diocese. For instance, does a resolution have priority over the, over the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer? Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> so if the... So if he's compelled to violate the Book of Common Prayer as it is plainly written in response to a single resolution, uh, that upends the doctrine and discipline of the church. Now, why is this a good thing? Because it's going to put in what I pray and hope will be a detached, non-biased environment to thresh out what has so far been a power battle. The gay lobby has pushed for this and they've won but is it in conformance with the canons and constitution and the legal authority of the Episcopal Church? Now, yes, it would be wonderful if we didn't even have this fight. Yes, it would be wonderful this, if this were self-evident. But we don't, we don't need to surrender just because we've lost one battle. The war is far from over. All right. So we've, in our pre-show, talked about the topic, uh, and it's a big topic. And this show may go four or five hours. I want to warn you ahead of time. Um, and I kind of want to start this off by just saying journalism itself is broken. Politics is broken. The church is broke. There's so many things in this world that is broken. And, you know, we can't hit, uh, cover all that in, you know, one single sit down topic. And so week to week, we sit down and we, we discuss what we're going to talk about. This week, I think we're talking about the mother church. Um, it's a popular topic. Uh, lots of people from uh, England watch us. In fact, the number one viewership or listenership on our podcast was from Oxford last week. 82 people downloaded the, the podcast. Wow, Oxford. Ooh, well, that's because we talked about Oxford. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Mother Church because... Um, Kevin, don't use that phrase. What? The Church of England is not the Mother Church. Oh, come on. That's what I heard. No, it's not. The Church of it. I mean, mm -hmm. the Mother Church is the church founded by the apostles. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if we, no, seriously, if we're going to start using the phrase Mother Church, there's a real one. It's called the Catholic Church. In so my show notes, I said the mother's dying. I, I thought we no, could no, go but, with that. No, but. <laughs> I, I yes yes we draw our liturgy and our doctrine and much of our discipline, but no, it's not the mother church. Oh, it on. has it, no it has no parental function over the <laughs> Anglican world. And Gavin, if we call it the mother church, we're giving them an authority that they've never ever ever had. I want to ask Gavin. Gavin, can we call it the mother church? 
No. <laughs> well, there you go. So <clears throat> what do we call it? The broken church, obviously. <clears throat> well, it's it's the interim church. We uh, the mother, George is right. The mother church is uh, is a church of Rome, the Western Patriarch, um, who brought to, uh, and said the, the evangelist to us in five nine seven that the church the church in England has operated uh, across the boundaries of of Catholicism and Reformed Christianity, um, and it's now about to enter what looks like a terminal stage. It spawned many. I suppose it has it spawned children. I think it spawned siblings, hasn't it? Siblings. It's, 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 been, a mid, it's been a midwife. It's been a midwife. The spirit has spawned the Methodist movement, the Episcopal Church in the United States of America. But the Church of England did its very best to make sure none of that happened. I Seriously. think it's an older sister who's gone off the rails. Yes. <laughs> Good analogy. <laughs> okay. A, maid, a maiden aunt that we uh, only see at Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving. Okay, well, let's talk about the aunt who's uh, uh, the crazy aunt, obviously. Um, and this is the hard part because as journalists, we get information all the time. And uh, we've been given a salacious photo. And we, as journalists, what do we do with it? Well, we're not going to just put the photo out there. But we need to talk about the context with which this photo exists because for some people it's a photo taken at an event in england where yeah no big deal now kevin i, I would just to make sure are we talking about the the photo of the abortion clinic opening in the narthex of st helens in uh, bishopsgate no, 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 no. Or, or are we talking about another photo in the, in uh, the, which, it, which, because you know that that first we've had a lot of before we get to the uh, the group shot that the you're referring shot. to, yes, I, I, I'd like to uh, just touch upon the excitement in uh, on social media over a recent uh, article by Jules Gomez. Sure, uh, can, it, but uh, uh, hold on a second. It didn't make the show notes, but I'm going to allow this exception <laughs> because our pre-show was so crazy. It's unscripted. I, I used to teach all my students and say, "Let me know in your essay what you want to talk about." So well, what I think we want to talk about is the multiple personality disorder of the crazy older sister. <laughs> and, and she has three personalities and they're really all, they're getting screwier and screwier. There's a conservative person, an evangelical personality, uh, an Anglo-Catholic personality and a liberal personality. And this week they all went off the rails in their own inimitable way. George, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jules Gomez, who was a contributor to Anglican Inc. and a well-known uh, commentator, author, and he uh, published an article that stirred a hornet's nest. Now, I'll be the first to admit, we don't use every single one of Jules' articles because he, <laughs> his language is stronger than I personally care for at times, but I it's believe his... Asian hyperbole. <laughs> yeah. uh, That's true, yeah. Nonetheless, I think his uh, motives and his heart are in the right direction, and he does a very good job. He's a very good writer. We uh, we had an article he submitted uh, about uh, an abortion uh, and a pro life group uh, and its relationships with a uh, flagship conservative church in London, and the article was rather harsh on the parish um, on the issue of how, what how much were they teaching about abortion. It wasn't that they weren't teaching on abortion, but given their prominence in the conservative evangelical world, should they not be doing more? Well, I looked at the article and I said, I can't pass this because there's, it's, it's one-sided. Even though Jules said that the people didn't respond. Well, I contacted the parish and I said, I've received this article. Uh, I'm not really ready to run it because I'd like to hear from you all. And if I do run it, I'll run it as an opinion piece, and I'll run to your response or comment or critique as to, do, if you will, rival pieces. Well, they chose not to respond. And what the funny thing is, is that I've been doing this for over 20 years, and the Archbishop of Canterbury responds, Westminster Abbey responds, Vatican Press Office responds, the, the presiding bishop responds. Uh, the Church of Scientology responds. The it was probably respond. one of the first times that, uh, given a particularly damning critique, uh, the responsible people chose not to speak to the issue and let, and in essence, publish and be damned. 
So we publish with a little note saying we held off for a week to ask them to, for clarification. They chose not to. And boom, then all hell broke loose is how I would describe it. Well, I think the response from what I can read is multi-level. I see a little bit of racism in the responses. I see people who never read the article in the responses. I see people who hold this church holier than now in the responses. And I see people who say, what, where's the story? in the responses and let, let's just you know where's the story is a perfectly valid critique sure. it's a it's a it's a question of taste i don't think this rises to being a cutting edge exclusive world story and that's subjective and in a and on a busy news week yeah you're right uh we didn't know that bill love later that day would be suspended it would have been shoved another week it'd been shoved aside and might have been lost well, when it's a slow news week and you need to put out copy, you put out copy. So that's a valid criticism that uh, we can't really fight. The uh, I'm a foreigner. I'm not English. And my antenna just started going off in the way that not that a number of commentators, not all of them, but a number of them, people whose names I recognize and know and have met, attacked Jules Gomez personally for his article. And as the fight intensified, what I got away with this is, who is this little brown man telling us English people what to do? Oof. Yeah. No, I'm, yeah, I'm serious, yeah, Kevin. I, I, Maybe I, I'm an American and sensitive no, to racial uh, racial uh, stereotypes. But man, this this is this began to stink quickly. Gavin, I, heard, I read the same things. I'm a great admirer of Jules. I like him very much. I think mm -hmm. he combines a very good heart and a very good a good head. Uh, and I like his Asian hyperbole. I know that not everyone does. What was surprising in this was, um, as you say, there really wasn't a story. It was a, it was a question. Here we have an organization saying, we, we'd like you please to concentrate more on one of the major social ills of our day, which is abortion. Um, I have to say, from my own point of view, I really didn't get abortion until about five or six years ago when, when the numbers hit me. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, the number was six million, which is the Holocaust number. So the number was six million. Um, there's also a spiritual aspect to this, that um, a society that societies in the past have sacrificed their children to gods mm -hmm. in order to gain things by this magical contract. Um, it's not a strong leap of the anthropological imagination to see that our society is sacrificing its children to the gods of pleasure and convenience. The trouble is, once you've seen that, abortion moves from being a third-rate or fourth-rate ethical issue to right bang near the top. Now, the, the problem is that Jules, what Jules was raising, Jules has seen this for a while. He's been an anti-abortion activist on the Isle of Man. It, he, he gets it, and I think he's right to get it. I've recently got it. I think it's right for me to recently get it. There are a lot of people that don't get it. So what he was really doing was asking people to give the matter more consideration. Uh, what should not have happened was an enormous amount of personal vituperation. So then we have to ask why, by raising this question about St. Helens Bishopsgate's ethical Christian teaching, should Jules be on the receiving end of such, such a, 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 a most unusual and unwelcome level of personal hatred? Well, before we go there, a lot of our audience doesn't know who this uh, church is. St. Helens Bishop Gates became famous in the uh, 70s under its rector, Dick Lucas. Uh, one of the great, great preachers, in my mind, of the uh, second half of the 20th century. And it has uh, created a marvelous conservative evangelical ministry in the city of London. It's, uh, <coughs> I think, one of the mo has one of the highest... Uh, it's a powerhouse evangelical church in terms of attendance, in terms of <coughs> its, uh, in terms of its presence, and I th and I think this is what Jules was saying is that, given its prominence, should it not be? Jules had an opinion. Jules was taking an uh, uh, taking an issue. They're not responding to an abortion anti-abortion group, and asking the question: Should they not be speaking more loudly? And the answer in a normal world is, yes, we probably could be doing more, but here's what we're also doing, and we haven't really put that in the <clears> forefront. <throat> but this is what we are doing. In other words, that's how, frankly, a rational being acts. And 
Kevin, I've been doing, you know, we're all adults, the three, we're far more than adults, we're old men. And in our life experiences, when someone respect, re responds disproportionately to the outrage of the issue, that soon becomes the issue. It does. And from a press report, it's, what are they hiding? I mean, the last time somebody acted this way when I, as a religion reporter, was the AMIA. It was. And then I did an article once about Scientology. And I hate to group St. Helens Bishop Gate with the AMIA, but that's how they responded of attacking Jules, attacking AM, AI, attacking George, attacking Gavin. I mean, nobody ever attacks Kevin because everybody loves Kevin. But Pure the, as the driven snow I am. <laughs> but the the response and the anger and so and some of the class tropes and the race tropes and the resentment of that who is this Indian who is this American website trying to involve us into the American culture wars of abortion now this is how I read this and it's my subjective opinion but Folks, I do this. I've been doing this for a long time, and usually I get this level of things right. I think the thing that causes so it caused me two kinds of anxiety. One is uh, that the conservative evangelical constituency still doesn't get the very serious metaphysical evil that abortion is, and and would that it did. But the other one is if you don't belong to the club, don't you dare attack it, or we'll all join on you in a kind of Lord of the Flies moment and make sure you never do it again. Now, the reason that matters is because we, we, need, um, we need evangelical Anglicanism in this country to cooperate and to, to do it in a spirit of, of generosity uh, across, the, across the boundaries. One of the great problems we had at GAFCON, we saw with the English group there, was that amongst a fairly large number of people, it broke down into myriad of interest groups who didn't understand each other and didn't get on and belonged to different clubs. Um, we're reading 1 Corinthians uh, 1 in the, um, in, in, the, in the morning prayer at the moment, where St. Paul berates the Corinthian church for its party spirit. What we have here is a very serious dose of party spirit, and it's really going to cause difficulty in renewing the Anglican church, unless somehow it can be, uh, it can be overcome. I think Jules lifted up the stone, and, and what need, what, what's underneath ought to be looked at, acknowledged, and repented, rather than have the stone pushed down and other stones thrown. Now, I think we should, Kevin, I think you and I should point out that what are we saying or what are we not saying? We are not saying, and Jules Gomez did not say, that St. Helens is completely silent about abortion. That they are, we, we have not, uh, nor are we saying that Jules Gomez has turned out the best piece of journalism in the 21st century. What we are saying is that we are shocked uh, well, I am shocked by the vituperative response to this article, the, and I the, don't get that. Well, and but that's the problem here is the response was over the top. What are they hiding, or what are they protecting, or what do they believe the church is really about? Jules' piece was just a mild opinion piece until the response came, and the the criticism, as we we cover that four uh, category gambit, um, was surprising. Because, yeah, he didn't really push forward that there was really a story here. The story would have been if St. Helens Gate said, well, we don't talk about that in our church. That would have been the story if there was a response. He was looking for his story, and he, and he found it and wrote an opinion piece. That's why it's an opinion piece. But the, the lightning strike that came after that tells me like we found with the EMEA, what we found with Nixon, what we found with the other things, is there's something deeper here. And I think the deepness here is the company. Now, if I were Jules Gomez, I would be sort of honored that I'm being treated like Donald sure. Trump. Yes. Uh, in other words, this is really does a great deal for his profile. So, folks, if you want to pump up his viewership and readership, keep pouring it on. But I don't think that's best for you spiritually. But. Well, but let's. I, I want to talk about the company. Okay, uh, we've been critics of the Church of England for a long time, and there are. I'm not going to say healthy elements, but there are elements within it that are still alive. But so much of it is dying or dead, and it's it's our great sister, the uh, psycho 
on the bed, lying, dying. What do we do with her? <laughs> Kevin, I think you should insert the Monty Python uh, skit right. from the uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. <laughs> uh, the Church of England is not quite dead. Not yet. dead yet. Well, if you could wait a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Johnsons have six already. Well, whatever. <laughs> so where are you going, Kevin, with this arch response to the wider Church of England? It's not just the conservative evangelicals have problems. What's okay, the well, here, here's what happens. We have programs all the time that criticize the Anglican communion as a whole, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church. Are there other alternatives out there? It, what are the alternatives in uh, on the shores of the UK, Gavin? Big sigh. Thing, think, come on, there's yeah. got to be something. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for for some time. I, I'm... Um, uh, as I look forward, I see two kinds of Christianities emerging in this country. One is the Roman Catholic Church, which is growing exponentially, partly by immigration, it's true. Uh, it, they have their own very serious troubles about who Pope Francis is and what it is to live in the, in the year of two popes and um, uh, their, own, their own problems with with Catholic spirit. Um, so I'm not bigging them up. But on the other hand, they're there and they, they, they combine gospel and sacraments. And on the other, at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, reformed Protestantism uh, rooted, I think, in the experience of, of Christians coming together in twos and threes and reading the scriptures together in their homes in uh, a, very, a, a primitive and very pure expression of Christianity. The Church of England for a long while has been a bridge between those two. And the problem is if it disappears... Um, there is no real uh, um, combination of gospel and sacrament. You, you get either gospel or, or sacrament, sadly. So what's out there? Well, the liberal Protestant churches have, have almost disappeared. Church of England has become a liberal Protestant church, and it appears to be disappearing. At the moment, for us, the issue is, is there a form of Anglicanism that can be retained and, and refreshed? Or, or does, does the... Does the increasing decrepitude of psycho sister mean that all we're going to have is 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 gospel on one hand and sacrament on the other? Um, we're 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 trying to find out. We don't know is the answer. Well, Kevin alluded at the beginning of our show about a photo we received over the transom. The picture. The picture. A real picture. And some people have said the way forward is the society, the Anglo-Catholic traditional Anglo-Catholic movement. And Gavin, I'll let you tear this apart because you have less to lose than I do. <laughs> well, I'll describe the photo. You describe the situation within within Anglo Catholicism in the society. No names, please. No names, or just names that who can't bother us. Well, are you going to describe the photo then? I'll do the photo. You do the. Okay. I'll, I'll do the. I'll do some commentary or context. Well, we received a photo of a gathering of uh, young men, Anglo-Catholics. Um, it was a, a selfie from a uh, all-male party of Anglo-Catholics. Uh, and, and when I looked at this, uh, this was a gay party. And it, prominent in the photo were a bishop of the society being given a very strong embrace by another bishop of the Church of England. Um, now, I, I saw this and my alarm bells went off, said, oh my God. And Kevin looked at this and said, oh, well, they're just having a good time. Yeah, just, they're drinking and having a holiday. Uh, <laughs> and George is like, snow. <laughs> no, I mean, George goes, the, where are the girls? Where are oh, the girls? This bro, is the first right, rugby saying, team yeah. photo without beer steins <laughs> and girls. Um, this was, this was a, uh, a very difficult photo because there are rumors about the sexual behavior of certain bishops in the Church of England and here we had oblique confirmation of that. Now we have some out gay bishops in the Church of England, one Bishop of Grantham, Gavin, is that correct? Yes, that's right. He lives with his he lives with his partner but they promised the Archbishop of Canterbury they don't have a sexual life at night together in bed. And then there's a lesbian bishop but we don't have that same promise that she lives with her partner. Uh, in I think the diocese of Salisbury or Bath and Wells, somewhere down that part of the world, Wiltshire area. So we have 
already have gay bishops, but the, the, the wink, wink, nod, nod is that they're celibate in their relationship. Now we have a single male bishop and another bishop uh, arm in arm in a uh, pose that is one not of camaraderie, but I would interpret as uh, affection, alcohol-fueled affection. So what do we do with this photo? <laughs> is it Indeed. photoshopped? Is this? Is this? What do we do, Gavin? Well, what it, is this? Tell us anything about the Anglo-Catholic movement and the society, because the one of the bishop receiving the affection is a prominent leader of the society. And what is this a society? <laughs> right. One of the changes of culture that the Archbishop of Canterbury has introduced is is the appointment of. Of a, of a gay partnered bishop, ch chaste or not. Um, the problem is the moment you do that, you've, you've made a step change of culture. In one sense, it would be quite wrong for this picture to be uh, put into the public domain because uh, why, why pillory these two bishops when there, are, when, when there are other bishops who are in the public domain and partners already? In other words, the moment you, you uh, accept this as a, as a category of behavior and it's been accepted already, then there is no line to step over. The problem is that the Anglo-Catholic movement in the Church of England has presented itself as being different from the rest of the church because it's an orthodox Christian movement. But, it, but, it, but its orthodoxy lies in its refusal to accept women as priests and women as bishops. Orthodoxy, however, is much more than that. Uh, it, it ought to go right the way through the, um, the whole spectrum. And the, the accusation has always been, well, you're just misogynist. You're only orthodox because you don't like women. And the reason you don't like women is because you're gay. Now, that's not a good <coughs> reason for, liking, for, for, for not liking women. So, um, but it's the elephant in the room. It's the question that's always been asked. And it's really quite important for the Anglo-Catholic movement in the Church of England to say, uh, we don't support gay behavior. The problem is that it's well known that a large number of their clergy are gay, and particularly in London, uh, are gay and are not chaste. So the, the question is, is the Anglo-Catholic movement in England, in the Church of England, orthodox all the way through or not? Um, one of the problems was when Bishop Jonathan Baker, the Bishop of Fulham, did, signed the Tilling Report in favour of this new progressive sexuality. Uh, it made it much harder to believe in the society and in forward in faith uh, because of that. The only person who didn't was an evangelical, the Bishop of Birkenhead. Now, the problem with this photograph is it suggests that there is indeed a gay, a gay and erotic subculture within the society. And that's exactly what, what, what we don't want to hear at this moment. Um, there's no doubt at all that, that there's a proportion of Anglo-Catholics who are wholly dedicated and orthodox, not only in their understandings of gender, but also in their understandings of pra practice of sexuality. The problem is there are a number who aren't, and this photograph adds credence that the, the, the Episcopal leadership uh, crosses the line into those who don't. That's, why, that's where it becomes undermining and sad. And I think for our American viewers, this is probably going to be appallingly shocking because their image of forward and faith is shaped like by people like Jack Eicher and yeah. Keith Ackerman and Bill Wantland, where the last thing that you would imagine is them uh, boozed up in a gay, uh, gay party. Forward and Faith North America is a different organization than Forward and Faith in the Church of England. Forward and Faith in the UK is that in, in, the, in the US is traditionally minded on all of the ethical issues whereas Forward and Faith UK has become a, almost a single issue group, which is a negative issue. We don't like women. And as Gavin says, there's a, unlike Forward and Faith USA, Forward and Faith UK has a very strong misogynist element. We don't like women because we don't generally don't like women. And so everything flows from that. And how do you reform the, the church with that as your base, how do you go forward? Well, th there um, is in fact there is one one of the one of the society bishops, uh, Jonathan Goodall, who used to be Rowan Williams' chaplain, uh, is a man of immense integrity, and a lot of people are looking to him to be the next, uh, I suppose, leader of the Anglo-Catholic movement. But he has a number of Episcopal colleagues, and and the subjects of the photograph are some of the lead, one of the leading Episcopal colleagues. The issue is, I suppose. Which of these two figures sets the tone for the Anglo-Catholic movement in the Church of England? Uh, if it's Jonathan Goodall, well, then 
um, that's excellent. Uh, if it's a subject of the photograph, then it's going to be really quite problematic from an ethical point of view. Now, people are going to ask, why aren't we putting the photograph out? Well, we're not the National Enquirer. We're not a salacious blog. Uh, we're not uh, that type of thing. Uh, if the people in this photo want to put it out and it becomes public, we'll link to it. Um, what we're talking about is the context of the photo. It was very well described by George, um, and it's very well put into context by Gavin. And here's the problem. In the Church of England, there are all these different varieties uh, and societies, and none are the whole of orthodoxy. None are the whole of evangelism. None are the whole of Anglo-Catholicism. Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. I couldn't even say that word. <laughs> and and, and, and it, so the, this is why the church struggles so much. There's just no unity, and the, the disunity part uh, has no voice. So we might have looked at the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and the bit that he represents, uh, for 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 some level of uh, orthodox enthusiasm, and so we come to the next bit, which is the appointment of a director for the Anglican Centre in Rome. It's a very prestigious appointment, to tell you the truth, guys. In 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 past years, it was a little part of my my mind, which is I I wonder if they'll offer that to me one day. I would really like that post. It would be a great post. <laughs> <laughs> you live in a you live in a in a palace in Rome yes, on right. one of the principal thoroughfares. It's a lovely. Yeah. Uh, some Italian princess became an, married an Englishman a hundred years ago and left her palazzo to the church to the uh, to the church. Um, that's the best way to get things inheritance. And and so the the but it turns out that the man that he've appointed as interim director the the last the last director had some. Uh, some ethical problems, not unlike the ones we've just been discussing. Um, but the, the, so they, they've, they've appointed an interim director, but it turns out to be somebody who, um, as David Old, who's done most of the homework uh, in this, David Old has, has exposed the fact that he, uh, he, he almost believes nothing classical within Christianity. He doesn't believe in the resurrection, doesn't believe in the authority of the Bible, doesn't believe in Christian ethics. There's not much Christian he does believe in. And yet he's been appointed to this enormously important post, which is also a uh, almost a personal ambassadorial role between the archbishop and the pope. So it's in the archbishop's interest to appoint someone who truly represents him. And it's very odd indeed that the archbishop of Canterbury has made no public signal that he's unhappy or disquiet or lacks confidence in a representative who doesn't believe much that's Christian. Well, I'm watching the, the archbishop. Uh, well, uh, real quick here, I'm watching <laughs> the blame game. Well, the Archbishop didn't appoint this guy. Uh, have you figured out who really appointed this guy, George? Well, we it's difficult to connect the dots. Stephen Platten was the outgoing chair of the Board of Governors, and Michael Burroughs of Ireland, who is, is the new one, and Michael Burroughs is uh, an activist on the gay and uh, abortion and other issues within the context of the Irish Church. So we don't know which of the two appointed it. The Archbishop Cramner blog said it was Stephen Platten. Could very well be, but he was out of office when the uh, issue occurred. So somebody did it, but what we have seen uh, in the uh, Nicholas Helen of the Times, I believe it was, Sunday Times, had an article where he asked Lambeth Palace, and they essentially said, well, we did due diligence. <laughs> No, what does that mean? He d he doesn't have a drunk driving arrest on his record, uh, but does he actually believe in the Nicene Creed? No, he doesn't. But that doesn't matter because he's not been accused of a sex crime. So that's due diligence. Um, it's 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 worse than ridiculous. It's wor uh, This is just so darn silly. The Archbishop's office. It makes him look coming upon the Amazon.com fiasco, the TUC council and the Wanga money lending fiasco of this man not knowing what his staff and what the church is doing before he gets up there and in a burst of enthusiasm says or does something, he then has his legs cut out from underneath him. The man who, if you will, has oversight over the archic uh, Anglo Anglican Roman Catholic International Consultation talks about theology, doesn't actually believe in any of the theology that we thought we agreed on 1400 years ago. 
it's it, it's a joke. It, it's beyond caricature. I don't know how you could get more farcical than this. Yeah. Well, don't say that, George. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> why did you? Why did you just give the church a challenge, George? You can't be doing that. So yeah, and. and we're coming up on four hours here, guys, so we should probably uh, uh, cut short. Uh, and this is the problem. It's no longer a mother church. never was a mother church. Um, it's just so divided. Um, its best appointment to Rome was a non-believer. Uh, within conservative circles, there's no unity. And then we see salacious pictures of, oh, well, now we know why they don't believe what they don't believe. And it's just a chaotic Monday, Gavin. Well, it's a very good thing that the Holy Spirit renews the church. So um, as we, we, one of the things we said to ourselves is how can we leave people with hope if we're going to look at, look at pick up the stones and look at all this stuff? Um, and the answer is, this is where we say our prayers even more enthusiastically. We say, come, Holy Spirit, start with us and then sp spread it around. Um, we've no idea what the solution is. But, but the Lord has renewed and purified his church in the past. Uh, Lord, hurry up. Maranatha, do it again now, please. George? Or move to Florida. Or move to Florida. <laughs> oh, jeez. People, that was a fun show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode number 476 on the 14th of January, 2019.